Well, something that happened uh, early in my marriage, uh, Bonnie and I, as we were discussing having kids, a value that she, she was just absolutely insistent on was that we would sit around the table most nights to eat dinner together. And as we had children, this just became really just a part of our family routine. The boys would get dinner, they would take a bath, they'd get a book, they'd go off to bed. Now, let me be clear, that's a very oversimplification of the craziness of our bedtime routine. But one night, Tobin was sitting around dinner and he starts to declare to us, he goes, wait a minute, I'm dad, Zeke, you're mommy, Zeke's our baby, all right? He goes, mom, you're gonna be Zeke and dad, you're Tobin. So Bonnie and I, we look at each other and we think it's cute. So we start doing the kid thing of like, why? And I don't want to eat dinner. The moment the boys realized that we were playing along, the entire dynamic of our household flipped upside down. They were so into it. Now, for those of you who know my kids, they have a lot of energy. They work pretty Oh, uh, there we go. They have a lot of energy. Now, Joanne Danes took this photo of us uh, a couple of months ago, and I don't have to tell you, this chaos is not manufactured. <laughs> she can witness to how crazy it was just trying to wrangle them to take a couple of photos. And there's, they have a huge zest for life. So I have never seen them throw themselves into anything the way I've seen them throw themselves into playing mom and dad. Their priorities completely changed. Their identities completely shifted. It went from being like, how, how much can I get to? We need to get these kids to bed. <laughs> I can't tell you the number of times I heard them say, if you don't listen and obey, you better have respect. And if you don't listen, you're getting disciplined. I realized at that point, they're actually listening to what I'm telling them. It's a, a little sobering moment. Well, today we're going to continue our, our study in the, in the Gospel of John. And we're going to look at how Jesus has taken this idea of an upside-down kingdom. Jesus enters as the master, the Lord, the one with absolute authority over everything. And he moves himself into the place of servitude. Flipping upside down how the disciples live together, fellowship with one another, and even connect to Jesus. And he shows us through an object lesson of washing their feet. So if you have your Bibles with us, with you, turn to John chapter 13. And we're going to read verses 1 through 17. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, by the time of supper, the devil had already put into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given, him, given everything into his hand, and that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, laid aside his robe, took a towel, and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and dry them with a towel tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you don't understand now, but afterwards you, you will know. You will never wash my feet ever, Peter said. Jesus replied, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. One who is bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need wash, to be washed anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. You are completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. This is why he said, you are not all clean. Will you pray with me? Father, God, I'm asking for wisdom as we pursue your story. Help us understand and see the scriptures the way you have them for us. God, may I fade away and only your words exit my lips. And God, may my words capture their hearts and may they change us. In your son's name, amen. As we explore this passage, 
Nope, I think I'm going too far. Oh no, I didn't, I didn't finish reading it. I'm silly. There's more verses there. When Jesus had washed their feet and put aside his robe, he reclined again and said to them, do, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord. This is, this is well said, for I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do, just as I have done for you. I assure you, a slave is not greater than his master, and a messenger not greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed to do them. As we explore this passage, now we're back on track, we're going to look at a big idea. And the big idea is simply this. In the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, we are to know as Jesus knew and do as Jesus did. These, there's wisdom here in this passage of scripture for us. It helps us understand how we're to operate and value things of Jesus's kingdom that operate and value differently in the world and culture around us. See, Jesus, by washing his disciples' feet, helps them realign three things, their identity, their fellowship, and their priorities. Let's start out by looking at Jesus's realigning their identity. <coughs> See, John chapter 13 is a turning point inside of the scriptures, inside of the gospel of John. The entire gospel, we keep hearing Jesus say, my hour hasn't come. My hour is not here yet. He's being super secretive about it. But when we hit John chapter 13, we know for a fact that Jesus knows this is the time. This is the moment. And in chapter, in verse 3, we get a picture of Jesus' confidence in his identity. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. Now, this word knew in Greek gives the understanding of an absolute knowledge. There was nothing hidden from him. There was no question or, or worry or doubt, none of that. He knew everything well, that was going to happen. And all authority had been given to him. Everything had been given into his hands. He knew for a fact that his fellowship with God was unbreakable. There was nothing that could, that could stop him. And no one can move against him or act against him without his permission. So here he is, master of everything, has total authority. And what does he do? He puts on an apron. He steps into the position of a servant. When I was in university, I, I went to university in this place that is, well, it's possibly the second windiest place in the world. It's flat as this stage. If your dog runs away on a Sunday, you'll see him running on a Tuesday. It is flat and the wind just blows. I would be trying to walk to class and I look like a Charlie Chaplin character just trying to get through the wind. For those of you who don't know who Charlie Chaplin is, after this, go home and Google it. It's great. Wind would just go everywhere. And so dust and leaves and everything's just flying all over. One afternoon, the president of the university is walking through campus, going to a meeting. I don't know what he was doing, but there were leaves and dust all over the steps leading up to like the main auditorium on campus. And instead of calling maintenance or ground, the ground crew, he just picked up a broom and just swept it up, just quietly worked, serving everybody else, just swept it away, cleaned it up, and then went on about his way. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm just kind of like, the president of the university just did manual labor, like, like it was nothing. So me and a couple of buddies, we were laughing and joking with him a few weeks later, and I ask him, why did you do that? Why didn't you just call somebody? And he simply looks at me and says, Micah, if, if you want to be a leader in a place of authority, you must be willing to go to the places others don't want to. And you must be willing to do the things others don't want to. See, Jesus is stepping across social barriers. He's taking the position of an enslaved person. He is going where others do not want to go. And he is going to change the way the disciples relate to each other and connect with Jesus. Theologian Warren W. Wersby puts it this way. 
Jesus was sovereign, yet he took the place of a servant. He had all things in his hands, and yet he picked up a towel. He was the Lord and master, and yet he served his, his, his followers. Let's look at Jesus became, Jesus knew who he was. And because of that, it determined what he did. Let's look at how it realigned the disciples' fellowship. Verse 6 through 11. If you go back and read that, this is a classic Jesus-Peter interaction. And so for those of you who may be new to, to Christianity, trying to figure this thing out, or new to like the gospel story, Peter is going to end up being one of the main leaders of the church. He's going to be the rock which the entire church is built upon. But before that happens, he's kind of known as a hothead. He's He's, he, he just lets his lets his words fly out whenever he wants. He has equal opportunity of speaking foolishly as much as wisdom coming out of his mouth. He's one of those guys where you're like, please just don't say anything because we just don't know what's going to happen. And so here we are in verses 6 through 11. Peter and Jesus are having this moment together. And honestly, I'm encouraged by Peter because I realize there's hope for me. <laughs> Don't ask my wife how often my mouth just flies out. But there's wash, washing feet is the lowest job, and Jesus is approaching him. Gentile slaves were the ones in that culture who washed the slate. Not even Israelite servants. This was the lowest of the lowest jobs. And in Jewish culture, over their history, they'd come to expect the Messiah, the one that was going to save them and rescue everyone and establish this kingdom that was going to conquer Rome, push everyone back, put a new world order in, and Israel was going to be at the seat of power. This was the type of person that they were expecting. So Jesus crossing all of these social lines, washing the disciples' feet, not to mention not representing the Messiah in the way that's in Peter's mind. Peter comes with a very strong opposition. You will never wash my feet. This is, in some of your translations may say, by no means. This is a double negative in Greek, and it doesn't cancel each other out. It intensifies. This is possibly one of the strongest ways of saying no. Where I'm from, we say, it ain't happening. No. You will never wash my feet. Jesus replies to him and says, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Now, the next few verses can be a little tricky. And there's several interpretations of how you can take it. I'm just going to give you where I sit and what I'm convinced of and what I see in Scripture. Jesus tells him, if, you, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. And Peter goes from one extreme to another. He says, Lord, wash all of me. Wash my hands and my feet and my head and just, just cover me. See, for Peter, this was a, I believe, was a place of prideful status and belonging. He'd already washed some of the other disciples' feet. So he's saying, Jesus, elevate me. Bring me up. You see, and this is important. The word wash here in verse 8 means to wash a body part, wash your feet, wash your hands. Peter saying, cover me completely. In verse 10, the one who is bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to be need, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet. He is already completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. See, this Greek word, the word bathe that's translated here, means to wash entirely. And so there's a line of demarcation being created. Jesus is trying to communicate to Peter, there is no need for you to try and gain status, belonging, in churchy terms, salvation. You are already a part of my kingdom and my family. By me, washing your feet has nothing to do with your salvation, but it has everything to do with fellowship. I'm going to walk with you. You are going to walk with me. 
There is a place here where you are growing in spiritual maturity. You are in relationship with Jesus. You are learning to deal with the circumstances and situations around you in the same way that Jesus would respond to those situations. He makes it clear, though, that not all of them are clean. For he knew who would betray him. And this is why he said, not all of you are clean. He's referring to Judas, who has made a decision not to enter into fellowship or relationship. He's present. He's around. But he is not engaged in relationship with Jesus. He has decided to do what is right in his own sight. And he's going to betray Jesus to the authorities. See, Jesus is honing in on the idea that service is not about bringing new, social, is bringing new social order, but it also builds the fellowship, the bonds that are between him and his disciples and the disciples themselves. As I prepared this week, there was also another line that I could just see being drawn out here. Jesus is giving the disciples not only what the relationship is, living in humble service to each other, but he's also giving them how to access the fellowship. You see, when you are in this space of serving humbly your community, maybe you're in tribe or in fuel or just somewhere in the, in the multimedia, somewhere in our congregation, you take a place of serving, even outside of our congregation in the community. In that space, there is this sweet moment of fellowship with Jesus. You can access Jesus in a lot of places, out in nature on your own. But I think Jesus is giving us a space that is really unique. And it is in the moment that you decide to serve. Now, this is not serving out of a sense of duty or responsibility. Or the idea that unless I do it, it won't get done. It's when we take those moments and we place them up under the authority of Jesus that we encounter him in a new way. This might sound weird to some of you, but in those moments of where you are serving, you and Jesus are doing it together. You're serving together, building your relationship as you do it. As you begin to find life and joy, serving, walking in humility, find fellowship with Jesus, your priority shifts. Things begin to move for you and how you see the world should operate around you. Let's look at how Jesus realigns their priorities. Jesus lays a new path for his disciples. Each of them ultimately, and with each of them, and ultimately around the world. If you follow me, you do as I do. Let's look at verse 15. For I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done for you. This idea of just as I have done for you isn't just the example. We know the example is walking humbly. But the idea of doing it just as I have done for you gives the standard at which it needs to be pursued. It gives us the idea that this is the degree to which I need to go for my humility. Recently, a couple of, a couple of Christmases ago, uh, we... My wife's family chipped in to buy a trampoline for my kids. And when it got to the house, we realized it was enormous. We ended up calling it the fourth bedroom. The thing was huge. And like any good red-blooded male, I decided, I've got this. My priority was to get this thing done as fast as possible. So I started pulling out all the parts and the pieces. And you need to understand, because I'm also one of these people who want things done properly and correctly, I spent a good three, three and a half seconds glancing at what the trampoline looked like. Good. And I begin to put this thing together. 45 minutes, an hour goes by, and somehow I have gone backwards in the assembly process. I realized maybe I should think about looking at the instructions. Let's glance at a YouTube video, see how they want it done. You see, I saw the example. I knew what the trampoline should look like, but I tried to do it myself. I was unwilling to assemble 
the, the trampoline in the way the designers had intended. I attempted to assemble the trampoline under my own power and my own knowledge, and I found myself in strife. It wasn't until my priority shifted away from just doing it as quickly as I possibly could to doing it in the way the designer intended that I actually found success. See, in our culture, we've been told, just be kind. Stop thinking of yourself so much. Just think of others, which are good things. Like, I highly recommend you should be kind, and you should think of others. But when we sit in these places under our own power and our own authority and our own energy, there is a hard limit to how much kindness we will be willing to give. There is a limit to how much thought I will be willing to give to another person. It isn't until I take those desires and I stick them up under Jesus' authority that allows me to be empowered, encouraged, and to act in the true examples of humility. Jesus has shown us the example, and then he also tells us, you do it how I have done it. Later in the scriptures, he will tell you, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, this can be difficult and intense and honestly quite confronting. Realizing that Jesus is calling us into something that's truly amazing. He's calling us into this space of really deep fellowship, which is joyous and awesome but it will cost you something. It would be easy for me to simply tell you, go, sign up for tribe, get in fuel, worship team, go get with community care, matrix. I could list a myriad of places that you could just go plug into. But that wouldn't, that wouldn't serve you, and that would end up hitting that hard limit of how much you're willing to give. You see, for what I'm hoping is that we will find a space where the identity of Jesus, who he is, who you are in Christ, begins to actually internalize in you. And because of who you now know who you are, it moves you to act. Because it is no longer simply about your ability, but it is the fact that you are moving alongside Jesus. Now, for some of you, the Holy Spirit is calling you to move, and he has been doing it for a while. It is time to step in, to trust him, that the place of service is ready for you. That you need to move into that, knowing that you can expect to encounter Jesus and that he will fill your tank. For others of you, the moment that is here is for you to trust in your identity in Christ. To understand that it is him that we depend on. All the tasks and everything will get done. You get the opportunity to step into that place of service and go with him, declaring his kingdom all along the way. As we approach Easter, Holy Week, we're going to remember Jesus' death on the cross. And we're going to celebrate his resurrection and what that means for us. I encourage you this week to keep this idea in mind. We've gone through all of from this to that, the different elements of Jesus' character. It wasn't exhaustive, but it was poignant. I encourage you to keep this in mind over the next week and to meditate on these two verses. You call me teacher and Lord. This is well said, for I am. If I am your Lord and your teacher, I have washed your feet. So, ought you should, so also you should wash one another's feet. For I have given an example to you. Also, should you do just as I have done for you. Maybe take that, just those few verses, and read them again and again this week. Ask God to show you the wisdom of what is here as we point towards the ultimate expression of sacrifice and service in Jesus, as he laid down his life for all of us. Reading these verses to help us bring into our hearts to know what Jesus knew and to do what Jesus did. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for what you have done for us, that you have shown us 
a new way of living. God, that you have given us the opportunity to, to live in service with you. To be able to declare your kingdom by our humility. To walk slowly with people. May our, your identity be in our hearts. May our fellowship with you be rich, and may our priorities be yours. God, we ask all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.